Hey, everybody, and welcome. I'm thrilled to see you. I hope that you're able to join me live. And if not, you're watching this as a recording. Fantastic. Uh, the beauty of video is you can watch it whenever you want until this particular medium becomes as obsolete as a VCR. So watch it, let's say, within the next 10 years, and you'll be fine. Uh, I'm going to be speaking on three topics tonight about storytelling. But before I do, I just want to address the idea that is something holding you back from telling your first story or from finding stories, from engaging in, in all I have to offer? Because I was speaking to a young person today. My wife had a friend from Israel over the house, and then we went out for pizza and ice cream, and we were chatting. And uh, she's a PhD candidate, actually, and, and standing in front of other human beings and speaking makes her really nervous. So storytelling is way beyond what she thinks is possible. And so she asked me for some tips on how to public speak in front of other people, how to sort of engage in this process. And as always, I say the first thing you have to do is you have to start doing it a lot. You have to find stories that are worth telling and your life is filled with them and then begin telling them. And audiences can simply be your friends in the car, the person you're having dinner with, you know, at a party, you gather four people and you tell a story or you stand on a stage and you tell a story. All of those things are acceptable and everything in between conference rooms and church picnics and all of these other places, wherever you want to go, as long as you've got at least one person in front of you, you have an audience. And as soon as you have an audience, you can tell a story. So what's holding you back? I suspect it's one of two things. It's either you don't think you have stories to tell, which is crazy. It's not true. I've never met anyone who doesn't have a multitude of stories to tell. And if you think you don't, you're wrong. You're not that special. You're not a unicorn. You're just like everybody else. You've got stories to tell. You're probably not recognizing them as worthy of being told. And that is either because you can't see the value in them yet, or someone has told you there is no value. And that is the case oftentimes in this world. Very often we stop speaking and stop writing and stop being creative because somewhere along the way, someone said a terrible thing to us. Someone told us that we should not be doing the thing that we want to be doing. I was listening to a podcast called How I Built This Today, and the founder of the French Laundry, one of the most famous restaurants in all of the world, in the Napa Valley, uh, he was considering buying the French Laundry and launching it. And today it's a three Michelin star restaurant, one of the finest in the world. And as he was trying to debate whether he was going to raise $1.5 million, and he had $0 at the time, whether he was, deba he was debating whether this was a good idea or not. So he brought two of his smartest friends in front of him, and he pitched the idea. And he turned to the first one and said, what do you think? And his friend said, it's a terrible idea. Do not do it. And at that moment, he died inside. And he realized, I can't buy this restaurant. I can't become the next owner of the French Laundry. And then he turned to his other friend and said, what do you think? And his other friend said, it's a fabulous idea. I want to help you out. And that was it. He needed one person to say one positive thing to launch the most successful restaurant or one of the most successful restaurants in the world. Imagine if the second person hadn't been at the table. Is that you? Has someone said something to you that is so rotten, despicable, uninspiring, terrible, that they caused you to believe that your life isn't filled with stories or that you can't tell a story well or that the life you're leading is not story worthy because none of those things are true. If you're looking for someone to tell you that your life is filled with stories, if you're looking for someone to tell you that your life has enormous meaning and it's worth sharing, at least to yourself, if not to other people, because we are the first and most important audiences for every story we have. If you're looking for that person, I am the one. I'm the one at the table telling you that regardless of what your high school English teacher said or your college drama coach said or your mother said or your neighbor said or the last audience you stood in front of said, regardless of what anyone has told you in your life, your life is filled with stories. They're worth gathering, holding on to, and eventually telling. Don't let that stand in your way. The other thing that might be standing in your way is just fear. Fear of what people are going to think. And you're going to have to let go of that one too. A lot of people over the years have told me that I'm a terrible storyteller, a bad author, a bad writer, a person who says stupid things, all of the rotten things that a person could hear, I have heard them all. 
but I want to be a person who makes things. I want to be a person who collects the material from his life and turns them into valuable bits of story that I can share with the world. I want to write books. I want to write poetry. I want to write plays and musicals. I want to do all these things. And if you want to have a creative life, and I hope you do, whether that creation is a book or a movie or a garden in the backyard, that creation could be as simple as, I want to make the perfect apple pie. That would be fantastic. If you want to be a maker of things, and I hope you do, and change the world in a small apple pie way or maybe in the great American novel way, if you want to change the world and be a maker of things, you're going to have to accept the fact that some people are going to say rotten things about what you're doing. You're going to let that go too. Don't let either one of those things stand in your way. Let's start today. Let's find some stories. Let's tell them. I'm going to give you some tips today to help you along the way. Okay? So let's get started. All right. Number hey, thanks for watching and keep watching. I'm not done, but I wanted to let you know my name is Matthew Dix. I'm an author, a teacher, and a storyteller, and I teach storytelling around the world. My goal is to help bring great storytelling into your personal and professional life. So keep watching and check out the rest of my videos. They're going to help you become the storyteller you've always wanted to be. All right. Number one, I want to talk about turning small moments into big moments because that's important because most people, they look at their lives and they go, Matt, I haven't died twice. I haven't been in an armed robbery. I haven't been arrested and tried for a crime I didn't commit. Well, listen, those are five stories of 175 that I've told on stages. Yes, I have a lot of crazy things in my life that I've told stories about, but the vast majority of my stories and the ones that win the most moth story slams, the ones that are recognized quite often, they're the small ones turning small moments into big moments. So let me give you an example, a really great example from one of my smartest and best clients, a true fantastic storyteller. His name is Boris Levin. He's the CEO of Mock Corporation here in Connecticut. And he believes, like I do, that you start with a story and then you find a purpose for it later on. So many of the business people I work with, they think it's the other way around. They think, I have a problem, so i got to go find a story to solve that problem. No. I mean, that is a thing that sometimes we have to do. I mean, you want to keep your business going, and sometimes, you know, businesses can be threatened, and you have to actually solve the problem now, lest your business goes under. But if you're a storyteller, and you really want to change the way you're doing business and communicate with clients and customers and investors and your partners and your people, you're going to be a storyteller first. And you're going to find ways to use those stories in your business life. Boris is outstanding at grabbing small stories and bringing enormous value to them. So here's one of my favorites that he's recently told me. Boris wakes up on a Saturday morning and he hears a strange sound in his house. And it's weird. He's got a wife and a couple kids. None of them are ever up before, let's say, 8 o'clock on a Saturday. And he hears a sound. It sounds maybe like an animal in the house. He's thinking initially an intruder, but do intruders really break into homes at like 6.30 in the morning on a Saturday? It seems a little odd. The world is filled with crazy people, though. Maybe one of those crazy people has made it into the house. So he turns to his wife, and she's awakened now, too. She hears it, too, this strange sound in the house. And so he says, stay here, be ready to call 911. As he's getting up and heading to the bedroom door to open it, he's starting to envision like maybe a raccoon or a skunk has torn open a screen, they left a window open, and it's gotten into the house maybe, or it's trying to get in the house. Or maybe a bear has pushed open the, the garage door. You know, he lives in, a, in the kind of Connecticut town where bears happen to cross your front lawn sometimes. He's a little worried. He's got two boys in the house somewhere, and, you know, he doesn't want them hurt. So he pushes the door open, and he hears the sound. It's coming from down the hallway somewhere. So he turns to his wife. He says, just be ready to call, and he starts making his way down the hallway. He passes a couple doors, and then he sees his son's bedroom door slightly ajar, and he realizes, my God, the sound is coming from the bedroom. Oh, my God. And he's wondering what's happening with his son. His son is, let's say, about 10 years old. Like, maybe his son is in bed, and there's a raccoon or a squirrel or, God forbid, a bear or, God forbid, an intruder in the room, and he's pretending to be asleep, hoping that whatever it is is going to go away. Or maybe he's still asleep because he sleeps like a rock. Whatever it is, Boris is now terrified. So he creeps up to the door and he sort of tries to look inside. It's all shadowy and dark. He can't really see anything. So he takes a deep breath and pushes the door open. He can't believe what he sees. It's his son dressed in his little league outfit, tying his cleats, making all of this noise because this boy 
does not get dressed unless he's told to. And is not that great at it because he's 10. Boris looks at him and says, what are you doing? And his son says, Little League practice. That's the first one of the season. Doesn't need to even to wear a uniform to a Little League practice, but he's put his full uniform on. Why do you have your Little League uniform on at 6.30 in the morning? He said, I just can't wait to practice, Dad. It's six and a half hours away. It's two meals away, breakfast and lunch, before he even goes to the practice. He's already got his uniform on. This kid has gotten himself up earlier than ever before to put a uniform on because he's so excited about Little League practice. That's a small story. It's barely a story, actually. It probably doesn't even qualify fully as a story, at least not yet until we take it one step further. Boris knows, though, already he has a gem. Boris takes this little moment he has with his son, this suspenseful, potentially for a moment scary, kind of funny story about a moment that happens on a Saturday morning, and he transforms it. He finds meaning in it. He turns it into a story. What does he do? Well, he runs this company, and he wants his people, actually he wants himself and his people, to have the same kind of excitement over going to work as his son has getting ready for Little League season. Now, that might be a high bar, but Boris is not afraid of high bars. Boris would love for his employees to have that same level of joy and enthusiasm and anticipation that his son has getting ready to go to a Little League practice. So he uses that story to challenge his people and challenge himself. How can we be more excited about the work we're doing? His, his, uh, his employees, they're all owners of the company. It's an employee-owned company. So everybody has a part in it. So everyone should be pretty excited. But there are days when you're not. Boris says, on those days, what are we going to do? And he challenges them. He says, some of that's on you. you got to figure that out. you got to figure out how you're going to motivate yourself. And if you need help, Boris says, come and see me. We'll work something out. That's taking a small story and turning it into something bigger and at the same time, transforming it for business. I do this for people all the time. There is, there has probably never been a personal story that one of my clients has told me that I can't then help them find a way to transfer into business. And there has never really been a story that is too small that isn't worth telling. I always say this, if it's worth something to you or it means something to you, then it's worth something or it will mean something to other people too, no matter what happens. I have told stories where quite literally I am standing still for the entire story and nothing happens except for stuff in my head. And people love those stories. So small stories are perfectly fine. You should be looking for them. You should be holding on to them. You should be recording them through homework for life. Don't let those moments go because we let them go all the time. We throw them away like they're worthless. And Boris understands they're invaluable. They're the most powerful and amazing things that we have when we put them to use for ourselves. Okay, so that's lesson number one. Before we go on to lesson number two, I want to mention, because I'm mentioning Boris and his kids, I'm actually going to be teaching a storytelling for parents workshop. This is a first ever workshop designed for parents to help you both tell stories to your kids to connect with them and teach them and, and share your life with them, as well as get them to start sharing their life with you. When my mother died in 2007, one of the sad realities I discovered was the hard drive that was my mother's brain, her memories, that instantly died when she died. Any question I did not ask my mother prior to her death will never be answered. Anything I want to know about her or my childhood, the parts that I can't remember, it's lost to me forever when she passed away. I had no idea how awful that would feel until the birth of my child, Clara. She was not alive for the birth of her granddaughter. And it was not an easy birth. There was a lot of pushing and a lot of people and then a C-section, an emergency C-section. And as all that was happening, I started thinking, what was my birth like? You know, how difficult or easy did I emerge into this world? I'll never know. She's gone. That's a terrible thing that I don't want to have happen to anybody. And so this workshop is designed to avoid this, to avoid this problem that I have for you. I want you to learn how to find and tell the stories that are going to engage your kids. And I want to help you get your kids to speak more to you to get them to share their lives so that when they come home from school, they don't just say, how was the day? And they say, fine. So I want you to join me June 17th, the day before Father's Day, 
Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join me. There'll be a link here. So join me and uh, learn how to do that. Okay? All right. So that's number one. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, let's talk about why suddenly is a stupid word and all the words like it. It's simple, but it's really important. I was working with someone recently and they used the word suddenly. Suddenly, I looked over and saw it, right? The word suddenly is a stupid word because it conveys the idea that something happens unexpectedly, quickly, without warning, right? But suddenly doesn't do any of those things. It's sort of after the fact says, this is kind of how I felt. Suddenly doesn't make things feel sudden. It only says that they felt sudden. It does not show, it tells. When we're storytellers, whether we want something to happen suddenly or slowly, whether we want something to, you know, to happen in a, um, in a scary way, any of these feelings, any of these uh, reactions that we want our audiences to experience, we want the audiences to react to them too. We can't say something happens suddenly. We have to make it suddenly for the audience. So I can't say something like, I come down the stairs early in the morning and suddenly the cat pounces in front of me because he's hungry. Because that did not make it feel sudden to you. Instead, I would have to craft a sentence that would sound something like, I come down the stairs early in the morning. I take a step into the living room. Boom, the cat is in front of me. That's still not great, but it's better. Boom at least tells you, hey, something happened. What was it? The cat right? What I really want to do is put as much misdirection as possible. What I really want to do is say, I come down the stairs early in the morning. My plan is to write the next chapter in my book. It's been really difficult to get this. And now the cat's in front of me, right? So that at least creates a bit of suddenness. I'm trying to create the feeling in the audience's mind, not tell them how they should be feeling. That's why I hate that word so much. It's worse than all of them. Now, if something happens slowly, slowly I creep across the room. Don't say slowly I creep across the room. Creep across the room slowly. Say I take a step. I look around. I notice the refrigerator. The magnets are all screwed up. Charlie must have been playing with them last night. I take another step and a third step. And now I see a Cheerio on the floor. There's always Cheerios on my floor because my children are terrible human beings who can't clean up, clean up after themselves. I take a fourth step trying to avoid the Cheerio and I look across the room and I can see the table that I'm heading towards. I take a fifth step. Do you see how I'm moving across the kitchen slowly rather than reporting on the fact that I moved across the kitchen slowly? Listen for the L-Y words, otherwise known as adverbs. All the words that end in L-Y are pretty terrible. They all are basically telling instead of allowing you to show. Avoid the L-Y words. Instead, present the emotion contained within the L-Y words suddenly, slowly. Present that emotion. Cause the audience to feel some version of that emotion in themselves by avoiding those words completely because they do nothing for you. Nothing feels suddenly when you use the word suddenly. So let's avoid that whenever possible, okay? All right, and if you haven't yet, before I move on to the third one, what I'd love for you to do is to join my Facebook community where I leave lots of information and lots of tips and lots of tricks. It's StoryWorthy, a community for storytellers. You can find it on Facebook. It's a group uh, request to join. I'll let you in. Uh, this week, I've been dealing with Pixar's 22... Uh, strategies for telling a great story. Not all of them apply to the kind of storytelling that we do, but I've been taking the ones that do and sort of talking about why they apply to the stories you tell, whether it's a personal story you're telling to friends at dinner, a business story, you're talking to investors, uh, you're pitching a marketing plan, all of these things, Pixar is one of the greatest storytelling engines in the world. And they've sort of nailed this craft. And so I would love for you to nail it too. And so I've been writing about this, um, these things this week. So um, join my Facebook community. Also join my YouTube channel. Uh, it's uh, youtube.com slash storyworthymd. Okay, become a subscriber, ring a bell, do all the things you have to do to, to know when I'm posting something. There's more than 100 videos on there now that are stories that I've told and lessons that I teach, uh, ideas for storytelling, all of these things. Go there, check out all the videos. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you want. But you got to subscribe to the YouTube channel, storyworthymd. 
and ring the bell, hit the button, buzz the buzzer, whatever, whatever you do on YouTube to make sure that when I post something, you get to see it. Okay. All right. Last thing, topic number three, and then I'll give you a couple of bonuses. So topic number three is adding humor to a story. There's some places where humor hides, I like to say. Sometimes it's hard to make things funny. If you're trapped in plot, if things are happening and you have to report on what happened, it's harder to be funny. You have to genuinely understand how to make things funny. Sometimes you got to be a genuinely a funny person. It's not easy. That's a hard thing to do. It's a hard sell. But humor is hiding in easy places. And one is description. We often have to describe characters. We have to describe who someone is, what they're like, what they do. And oftentimes, that is an area where humor hides because that offers us a multitude from which to choose. I recently told a story to Moth Grand Slam. Actually, it's the same story I've used in Anatomy of a Story. So if you've participated in Anatomy of a Story or purchased that course, which is now available on my website, storywearthemd.com, you'll know the story. In the story, I have to describe my son, Charlie, my daughter, Clara. And when I talk about having a multitude of options, I need to tell you in that story that, for example, Clara interacts with the world in a different kind of way. Ultimately, we will discover at the end of the story, she has autism. So when she interacts with the world, everything is a little fraught and a little scary for her. At the time of the story, she's six or seven, which means I have six or seven years of content from which to choose. From the moment the story takes place all the way to her birth, I can choose whatever I want to describe her. And because... I want that portion of the story to be funny, or at least a little funny. I choose a funny thing. I choose an anecdote that is funny. Description can be funny because we have so much to choose from when we're describing someone, a particularly a person. So for Clara, I choose a moment when she is watching Curious George, a cartoon about a monkey and a man in a yellow hat living in a platonic relationship in New York City. It's George's birthday, and... The birthday cake's on the table and someone knocks the cartoon table and the cartoon cake sort of wobbles a little bit, threatens to fall off the table. Clara runs out of the room crying. She can't even handle that. She's so sort of fraught with the world that a cartoon cake falling on a cartoon floor in a cartoon about a monkey and a man is too much for her. It makes the audience laugh. I had a multitude to choose from. I could have said anything about her, anything that happened in the first six or seven years of her life. That's how description is so easy to make funny because we have a lot to choose from. When I go to Charlie, the first thing I say about Charlie, I say Charlie is nothing like Clara. I say Charlie has never met an object that he doesn't want to put into his mouth. Instant laugh and true. It's a signal as to how Charlie sort of takes on the world. While Clara is careful about the world, I mentioned she only eats four foods. In the story, I say pan she's eating pancakes, which is one of her four favorite foods, but that's not really saying much because she only eats four foods. Another laugh, again, talking about the way she interacts with the world. Charlie puts everything in his mouth, every object, right? It's a clear sign of how they are different, and it makes people laugh because it's true and because Charlie in the story is about four years old, which means I have four years of content from which to choose. So I choose the funny things. When it comes time to describe someone, Humor is a very simple way to both be funny and descriptive simultaneously. Oftentimes, I say one of the best ways to describe a person is to give us a physical characteristic and just one. Because you give us one, we can sort of build the rest of the human being for you, which is great. Right? There's this great principle in comic books. They've discovered that the fewer details in a comic book character's face, the more attached an audience will become to that character. So a circle with two eyes and a, and a mouth you'll actually become more attached to that character than a photorealistic character because with two eyes and a mouth, you will imprint all of the other qualities you want on that character. A photorealistic image of that same person doesn't allow you to imprint. It only gives you but does not allow you to push your own in. So if I tell you the woman with red hair walks into the room, I give you red hair, you fill in the rest for me. And because I'm a smart storyteller and I don't care if you see the same version of redheaded woman as I saw that day, it doesn't matter to me. Give you a redheaded woman and you can fill in the rest. Did you fill in the rest? When I said the redheaded woman walks into the, world, into the room, you saw her. I know you did. If I give her a name, you're going to see her even more. If I say Roxanne, the redheaded woman walks into the room, the name, oddly, will help you create the character. Right? You will envision the platonic version of redheaded Roxanne. You will. If I just tell you a woman walks into the room and her name is Lisa, 
just by telling you her name is Lisa will help you see her more clearly. You will choose the platonic version of Lisa in your mind. It's either a Lisa you know, or you might be saying, ooh, Lisa's an 80s name, so I'm gonna have an 80s typical person walk in, right? Whatever you're gonna do, a name will be enough. So I often say physical characteristic, a personality or a mental characteristic, and then a quirk. The quirk's the funny one. For Clara, it's the it's the cartoon cake. It's the four foods, right? For Charlie, it's he puts everything in his mouth. I say things like Charlie has never met a couch that he has not seen as a launching pad. He's never seen a set of stairs that he does not want to fall down. All funny things that indicate also who he is. Again, description offers us a multitude of options, which means we get to be funny when we're describing people. Don't miss the opportunity. Not every story has to be funny, but boy, does it help. Boy, does it help. If you're a corporate person, probably what you're thinking is, yeah, I want to be funny. And then when it comes time to be funny, you chicken out because no one else is funny. It's a whole different problem. We can deal with it another time, but you should be funny. Boy, do people like humor. Now, I tell some stories, probably three of the 175 I've ever told that have no humor whatsoever. They're not funny in any way, including the story about the death of my mother. Nothing funny in that story at all. Nothing should be funny. So humor is not required. It's not a necessity. It does not need to be ever present. But boy, does it help. It helps when you're in a boring section of a story. It helps to get the audience to like you. When you make an audience laugh, when you make anyone laugh, their brain releases three chemicals into their body. It releases um, oxytocin, which makes them feel better about you and the world and improves cognition. It releases endorphins, which makes them feel better as a human being and makes them feel safer and more connected to you. And it releases oxytocin, endorphins, and dopamine, which um, raises their spirits and makes them feel great. Essentially, when you make someone laugh, you're changing their brain chemistry. And the change, the shift in brain chemistry, benefits you. It makes them feel more connected to you. It makes them feel better about the world and, and, and everything happening around them. It may, improves their cognition. All of those things are really great. Actually, you get the same benefits from telling a story. Not quite to the same degree as a laugh, but again, we're changing brain chemistry. Laughs and stories. Changing brain chemistry, getting people to like us. When they like us, they like our stories, they like our messages, they believe us, we can convince them, we can persuade them, all of those things. Make them laugh. Make them laugh with descriptions about the characters in your stories. Okay, those are my three things I wanted to talk about today. I'm going to give you three tips. Now, if you go to storyworthymd.com, you're going to find a ton of free resources that will help you become a better storyteller. I'm going to give you three today. I have three that I listed. They're all basically dealing with the same thing, which is the beginning of stories, which is the most valuable real estate in any story. The beginning is going to convince the audience that they should be paying attention to you or they should be ignoring you. That's the deal, okay? So here's three tips for you today. The first is, how are you going to choose to begin your story? Because you have a choice, and most people sadly choose landscape and character. Let me tell you where we are and who we're dealing with. That is the worst place to start a story. Nobody cares about where you are unless something's actually happening, and nobody cares about the characters in your story unless they're doing something, saying something, or feeling something. So we don't start with landscape ever. We don't talk about where we are and what the place looks like. It's not the first thing you want to say. And we don't care about the people until they have done something. We want to start our stories with suspense, surprise, or humor. Essentially, the word I like to use is wonder. We're creating wonder in the minds of our audiences instantly. Pay attention to the way movies begin. The great ones, most of them, almost every single one of them, starts with some degree of wonder. Huh, where are we? Hey, what's happening? Hey, why did he do that? Hey, what did she mean when she just said that? Those are the questions we have. And then we find out who she is, who he is, where they are, what, what just happened, all of that. We have to create wonder at the beginning of a story. Don't start with landscape, for God's sake. And don't start with who the people are. Start with what they're doing, what they're saying, what they're feeling, and then fill in the rest. So that's the first one. The second one is related to that, start in a moment of meaning, which means have something happening. The phrase they use in film is in media res. It's Latin. It means sort of in the middle. And that's a great place to start. Don't start your scene with, I walk into the restaurant and I see the maitre d' and I tell him I need a table. 
That's not great. Start in the middle of the scene. Start with the maitre d' tells me he has no tables. Start with that. Isn't that better than I walk into the restaurant and I go to the maitre d' to ask him for a table? Forget that. The maitre d' tells me he doesn't have a table and I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know who you are. I know you're in a restaurant, but I don't know much more about that. I don't even know if someone's with you yet. That's in media res. That's the beginning. That's, that's the beginning that makes sense, which is to say it's the middle of the scene. It's the place where the good stuff happens. Start with the good stuff. Start with a sentence that makes people go, oh, that's a problem. I wonder how this problem is going to be solved. I wonder how he's going to get out of that. Start there. Start in media res. Start with the moment of meaning, not with the setup. Nobody wants the setup. They want the moment of meaning. Okay? All right. And tip number three, a way to grab your audience's attention. Start with the suspenseful stuff first. The example I give in my at storyworthymd.com for this one is a good one. I start a story with a sentence that says something like this. I'm 10 years old and the scissors in my lap are especially sharp. I'm waiting for the teacher to turn his back so I can put them to use. That's how I start my story. That's suspense. Now, oddly, the scissors don't really play an enormous part in the story. I'm cutting out dictionaries. I'm cutting out the definitions of dictionaries and replacing like the word stupid, the definition, rather than what it actually says. I'm replacing it with C. Mr. Morin, who is my science teacher. I'm editing dictionaries to insult my teacher. And I'm using scissors to do it. But if I start my story by saying something like I'm 10 years old and I'm sitting in my classroom, I've got scissors on my lap. They're especially sharp. I'm waiting for the teacher to turn his back. Well, now you're wondering what the hell I'm going to do with those scissors. And that's what I want. Because if you're wondering what the hell I'm going to do with those scissors, well, fantastic. Now I gotcha. Right? And as long as I keep giving you something to wonder about, I'm great. But let's start there. Right? Let's start in a moment of suspense. Let's start in a moment of wonder. Let's begin in a place where the audience must hear the next sentence. If the power goes out after I say, scissors in my lap are especially sharp. I'm waiting for the teacher to turn his back so I can put them to use. And the power goes out. I promise you, people are going to wait for the power to come back on to hear what I have to say. They want to know what that kid's going to do with the scissors. That's what you're looking for. The power goes out. Does the audience leave or does the audience stay? If they stay, you win. If they leave, you lose. We're trying to keep them in the room, okay? So you can find those tips and many more at storyworthymd.com. If you're interested in any of my courses, I've got Anatomy of a Story. I've got Finding Stories. I have a Storytelling for Business course, and I have a brand new humor course that's going to be out in, well, by June. By June, a humor course, which will teach you five fantastic strategies through cartoon animation, and so, uh, lots and lots of other things to help you become a funnier person. Simple strategies that you can begin applying today, both in your regular life and in your storytelling life. So check that out. Check out my courses. Check out all of my free resources at storywearthemd.com and check back in. I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope, um, I hope you're finding stories in your life. I hope you're making great use of them. I wish you all the luck in the world, and I can't wait to see you again.